Hey everybody, welcome back to Chem 103 lecture. We're at chapter 10 now. We're on gases. This is the final chapter for Chem 103. So congratulations, you almost made it through. First thing we're going to cover is the properties of gases. We talked about these in chapter 3 when we were talking about solids, liquids, and gases. But we're going to do a quick refresher. The five important properties of gases, they have a variable shape and volume. Let me get out my highlighter. They expand uniformly, compress uniformly, they have a low density, and they mix uniformly with other gases in the same container. We're going to go through each of these in detail. First, we'll tackle the variable shape and volume. The gas is going to take the shape of its container and fill it completely. So if the ch container changes shape, so will the gas. And you might be thinking, OK, how in the world does a container change shape? Well, oftentimes what you'll see when we're talking about a gas is some kind of a container that's got kind of a piston in it that you can move up and down. So this disc can move up and down and that will increase or decrease the volume in a container. So therefore it changes the shape. And when you do that, the gas will fill the container completely. Let's say that you had one of those volume changing chambers. If you increase the volume in that chamber, the gas is going to expand to fill the entire volume. If you then push down on the gas with that piston and compress it and decrease the volume, the gas compresses uniformly. And when we say uniformly, it means you're not going to have a big pocket of gas in one place and then empty space in another. We're talking about gas molecules uniformly spread out all across the volume of that container. If you reduce the volume enough, the gas will liquefy, which is kind of cool. Gases have a low density. We talked about density in chapter two. We brought density back in chapter eight when we talked about gas density. And I kind of told you to just take my word for it, gases have low density. The density of air, 0 0.001 grams per milliliter. When you compare that to the density of water, which is one gram per milliliter, air is 1,000 times less dense than water. So when we say low density, we mean low. The final property, gases mix uniformly with other gases in the same container. We talk about air a lot, but air is actually a mixture of gases. It's got a lot of nitrogen, it's got oxygen, it's got carbon dioxide, and a bunch of other things. When your car emits nitrogen oxide and all types of other things, all the gases that emit from your vehicle mix with all the gases in the atmosphere. A mixture of gases that's contained in a sealed container will mix to a uniform homogeneous mixture. In other words, they play well with others, right? The gas pressure on a container, that's the result of all the gas molecules striking the walls of their container. So if you think about Let's say that you had a room full of toddlers and you decided it would be a good idea to give them all a huge piece of birthday cake and a 
big old scoop of ice cream. After they consume all that sugar, they are going to be bouncing off the walls. That's how gases move. Remember, gases move in random directions. They bounce off of each other and they strike the walls. At a higher temperature, gas molecules are moving around more quickly and they strike the walls of the container more often and with greater force. So an increased temperature is going to result in an increased pressure. And we'll be talking more about the relationships between temperature, pressure, volume, all that good stuff when we get to the actual gas laws. But we're going to cover it a little bit here. So atmospheric pressure is the result of all the air molecules in our environment pushing down on us. Evangelista Torricelli invented the barometer back in the 1600s to measure the atmospheric pressure. Can you imagine being in 1600s trying to come up with ways to measure things that you can't see and or otherwise identify? People probably looking at you all types of crazy. Like, what do you mean atmospheric pressure? I don't feel any force pushing down on me. Now, we talk about science like it's this dead thing but scientists are people and they lived in history and the history you know surrounding their personhood surrounding you know all the events of the time all that stuff influenced how they operated so don't forget that scientists are people anyway here's a barometer on the right hand side there's this gray liquid in here which is mercury. Mercury is a very, very dense liquid. It's actually a metal. It's the only metal that is liquid at room temperature. You have some mercury in an open container that has a glass tube, an inverted glass tube. When the atmospheric pressure pushes down on the liquid mercury, some of it will travel up the tube. You can use a meter stick to measure the height of the mercury. One atmosphere is equal to a height of 760 millimeters of mercury, which is the same thing as 760 tor. So the tor, named after Evangelista Torricelli, that's also the same thing as 29.9 inches of mercury. So these are four different ways that we can talk about pressure of a gas. And you'll find all of those in this table 10.1. You do not need to memorize these. You should know that standard temperature or standard pressure is the atmospheric pressure at sea level. So that's 29.9 inches of mercury, which is the same as one atmosphere, 760 millimeters of mercury, 760 tor, okay. Some of these, you see the word exactly next to them. What that means is that these are exact numbers.
Now we're reaching way back to the beginning of the course where we talked about exact numbers and measured numbers. With exact numbers, we don't use them when we're looking at sig figs. So it's not included when counting sig figs. Only the ones that have exactly next to them. The others are measured. So let's do a practice pressure conversion you'll likely be asked to convert one pressure to another unit. So in this case, we have the barometric pressure is 26.2 inches of mercury. What is the pressure in atmospheres? Here's our relevant information. Starting pressure. These are the units that we need to convert to. You'll be provided with all of the exact conversions. So you'll know what one atmosphere is equal to in inches of mercury, millimeters of mercury, etc. Don't memorize that. If you're doing a homework problem, you can just look back at this lecture and you can use the table that's included. This is the unit equation that you can gather from the table. This will help us when it comes to converting from inches of mercury to atmospheres. We can write two unit factors from this, which remember the unit factors are like fractions. inches of mercury on top, atmosphere on the bottom, and the reciprocal. To set up our problem, we start with the given information, 26.2 inches of mercury. And we have to choose which one of our unit factors will get us from inches of mercury to atmospheres. We need to cancel out inches of mercury, which needs to be on the bottom. Cancel out your units. Make sure you have the one that you desire to have. We need three significant figures here. So our answer, we're going to take the 26.2, divide by 29.9, and you get 0 0.876 atmosphere. So don't forget sig figs. Report your answer with the right number and units. Here are the variables that affect gas pressure. We've got the volume of the container, the temperature of the gas, and the number of molecules of gas in the container. So let's talk about those. First, we'll talk about volume and pressure. When the volume decreases, the gas molecules are going to collide with the container more often. They don't have as much space to move around. That means the pressure is going to increase. For me, I like to write variables with arrows. The arrows give me a visual to understand immediately how a variable is affected. So volume, we'll use V. When volume decreases, that results in the pressure increasing.
The opposite is true as well. When the volume increases, the molecules have more room to stretch out and bump into something other than the container. They're going to bump into that container less often. So the pressure decrease. Now we'll look at temperature versus pressure. Now we already hinted at this, but when you increase the temperature, I guess we'll start with decrease first, that's the first bullet. When you decrease the temperature, we'll use T for temperature. The gas molecules are moving around a little bit more slowly. That means they're gonna collide with the container less often. If you collide with the container less often and with less force because you don't have as much energy, you're also going to decrease the pressure. The opposite is true as well. If you increase the temperature, then the gas molecules are going to have more kinetic energy. They're going to move faster, collide with the container more often, and with more force. So that results in an increase in pressure. Last relationship between something and pressure is molecules and pressure. We're talking about the number of molecules here. When the number of molecules decreases, we'll use N for the number of molecules. That's going to result in fewer gas molecules colliding with the size of the container. If you had a bunch of them, you remove some, you're not going to have as much in the way of collisions. So you're going to decrease the pressure as well. But let's say you add some gas in, you're increasing the number of gas molecules. Well, now you've got more gas molecules in the same volume. They're going to be colliding with the container, the container much more often. So you're going to increase the pressure when you increase the number of molecules. Now let's get into some gas laws. We'll start with Boyle's gas experiment. He was looking at the relationship between pressure and volume. He used a J-tube that had air trapped using liquid mercury. So you've got atmospheric pressure pushing down on the mercury and you have this air gap here. When the volume of air decreased, it was a result of him adding more mercury. So notice how you have a volume of 60 milliliters of air. You add more mercury. And suddenly, you have a decrease in your air volume. So he halved the volume and doubled the pressure. That speaks to how pressure and volume are related to each other. It's led to Boyle's law, which states that the volume of a gas is inversely proportional to the, temp to the pressure at constant temperature. This graph on the right shows what an inverse relationship looks like. High pressure, low volume, low pressure, high volume. 
the equation that we use for this, P1V1 equals P2V2. P is always equal to pressure. V is always equal to volume. The subscript 1 talks about the initial conditions of the gas. The subscript 2 talks about final conditions, what happens after you change something. With all of the gas laws, you'll see the same kind of initial and final conditions with the subscript 1 and subscript 2 for the variables. As we go through and do sample problems, I'm going to help you identify what is an initial condition versus the final condition so that you can set up your equation and solve properly. Here's a sample Boyle's Law problem. You will not have the luxury of knowing that it's a Boyle's Law problem from a conveniently placed title. You'll need to read through the problem, identify the kind of information you have, and match that to a gas law. That's what we're going to practice here. A 3.50 liter sample of methane gas exerts a pressure of 1550 millimeters of mercury. What is the final pressure if the volume changes to 7 liters? Well, we've got some numbers here. I'll highlight them. And we've also got this bit of question, final pressure. That's what we're being asked about. So that little bit of the question we need to highlight as well. Let's identify all of these numbers. We've got 3.50 liters. That's a volume. And since we're describing the sample that we have, it's an initial volume. So we're going to label that V1. And this gas exerts a pressure of 1550 millimeters of mercury. That's a part of the initial conditions. This volume of gas exerts this much pressure. What is the final pressure? Well, final conditions, we use a subscript of 2, so that's P2. No clue. That's what the question is. If the volume changes, that clues you in that you're looking at V2, the final conditions. If it changes to 7 liters. So for my conditions here, all the information that I have, I see pressures and volumes. That must mean that I use Boyle's Law. That's the kind of logic that you'll need to get through these gas law problems. Then, once you know what gas law you need, you write it out. P1V1 equals P2V2. I like to circle the variable that I'm solving for. We're looking for P2. To isolate that, I divide both sides by V2. V2 is equal to P1 times the ratio of V1 over V2. Now I like to arrange the equation this way because it shows you, oh, and see, I wrote V2 instead of P2. That gets to another point. You got to have good bookkeeping, y'all. All these letters, you got to have good bookkeeping. But I like to arrange my equation this way 
because it points out what units I should have at the end. So the units for my volume should cancel and I'm left with units of pressure. I'll show you what I mean. Let's fill in these numbers. P1, 1550 millimeters of mercury. V1, 3.50 liters. V2, 7.00 liters. Notice how these liters cancel out. And I'm going to be left with units of pressure. With these gas laws, for the most part, there is one exception. The units don't matter as long as you're consistent with P1 and P2 having the same units and V1 and V2 having the same units, you're golden. You put this into your calculator. You may want to use parentheses here to make sure that that division happens the right way. The answer that you get should be 775 millimeters of mercury. Now, before you say, okay, I'm done, close up your calculator, move on, double check and make sure that this answer makes sense. We know what the relationship is between pressure and volume. You can use that logic to make sure that your answer makes sense. If we go from a, a volume of 3.5 to 7, that means we're increasing the volume. Based on what we know about the relationship between pressure and volume, an increase in volume should result in a decrease in pressure. And that's what we see. The initial pressure is 1550 millimeters of mercury. And what we have is half that. So that is definitely a decrease. Make sure that you run through that little piece of logic before you sign off on an answer because that can save you some points. Next gas law, Charles's law. The relationship between the volume of a gas and the temperature in Kelvin is directly proportional. So that's Charles's law. Volume directly proportional to the temperature in Kelvin. I'm going to stress that here. Kelvin. You have to use Kelvin. As a refresher, remember, if you need your temperature in Kelvin, you take the degrees Celsius, you add 273. If you need to go in reverse, you have Kelvin and you need Celsius. Degrees Celsius, you take your Kelvin, subtract 273. Please use Kelvin. Does not work without Kelvin. Okay, gas laws, the kinetic energy of gas molecules is proportional to the Kelvin temperature. This is Charles's law. V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. To make this useful, the first thing you need to do is cross multiply. You multiply V1 by T2 and V2 by T1. And that gives you V1 times T2 is equal to V2 times T1. Then you can solve for your unknown variable. 
and I'll show you how that works in just a second. This is an illustration of Charles's law. As you cool a balloon from room, room temperature down to something very, very cold, the volume is going to decrease as well. Let's do a sample Charles's law problem. And again, you won't have the luxury of Charles's law problem as a heading on your exam or your homework. So make sure that you know what you're looking at. We've got a 132 liter helium balloon is heated from 20 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius. What's the final volume at constant pressure? Here's some relevant information. There's a volume, there's a temperature, there's another temperature. We're asked about the final volume. Just like before, we need to write out all of this information and assign what it is. 132 liters, that's a volume. And from the wording, that's describing the initial conditions. It's heated from 20 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees. From 20 degrees, that means it's the initial condition. We're heating it up to 40 degrees. That's our T2. What is the final volume? Well, that sounds like V2 to me, and we don't know what it is. Whenever you have just volumes and temperatures, you're going to use Charles's law. Remember, we have to convert our temperatures to Kelvin. It may be helpful to you when you're writing out the initial information and assigning your variables to just convert right away. It's totally up to you. I'll write my conversions up here. So for T1, we're going to take our 20 degrees Celsius and add 273, which gives us 293 Kelvin. T2, we take our 40 and add 273, and that gives us 313. Kelvin. Now that we've got those numbers, we can go to Charles's law and do some work. This is Charles's law. We need to cross multiply first. Then I like to circle the variable that I'm solving for. We're looking for the final volume. That's V2. To isolate that, I'm going to divide both sides by T1. I group my temperatures together, those units will cancel, and I'll be left with units of volume. Substituting your numbers here. V1, 132 liters. T2, 313 Kelvin. 
T1, 293 Kelvin. Again, you may want to use parentheses here. You should get 141 liters. But don't forget, we need to do our mental math check. We're starting with the volume at 20 degrees Celsius. We increase that temperature to 40 degrees Celsius. If we increase the temperature, then we're also going to increase the volume. We started with 132 liters, our answer is 141. That's definitely an increase, so we're probably okay. Don't forget that step. It may save you some points. Cannot stress that enough. The third gas law we're going to talk about is Gay-Lussac's law. He discovered that the pressure of a gas is also directly proportional to the temperature in Kelvin. Notice that this equation looks very suspiciously similar to Charles's law. It's the same type of relationship. P1T1 is equal to over P1 divided by T1 is equal to P2 divided by T2. Just like before, you'll need to cross multiply. P1 times T2, P2 times T1. That leaves you with P1 times T2 is equal to P2 times T1. From there, you can solve for your unknown variable substitute your numbers in, solve your problem. Let's try one. A steel container of nitrous oxide at 10.4 atmospheres is cooled from 33 degrees Celsius to negative 28 degrees Celsius. What is the final pressure at constant volume? Let's highlight some numbers here. We've got a pressure of 10.4 atmospheres. We've got two temperatures. And we're asked for the final pressure. Our first bit of information, we know it's a pressure. And it sounds like the initial conditions. Generally speaking, in a problem, you're going to be told what the initial conditions of the gas is first. Then you're told what the change is. Initially, pressure of 10.4 atmospheres. It's cooled from 33 degrees Celsius. So that must be our T1 to negative 28 degrees Celsius. That is our T2. We need to figure out the final pressure. That's P2. Don't forget to convert to Kelvin. You add 273 to each of these. Now we're ready to look at what information we have and figure out what gas law to use. When you have all pressures and temperatures, you'll use Gay-Lussac's law. P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2. 
we cross multiply. P1 times T2 is equal to P2 times T1. Then, circle the variable that you need to solve for. We need to figure out P2. Isolate the variable. We'll divide both sides by T1. P2 is equal to P1 times the ratio of T2 over T1. Fill in the numbers. Our initial pressure is 10.4 atmospheres. Final temperature, T2, is 245 Kelvin. The initial temperature, 306 Kelvin. When you do the math, you should get 8.33 atmospheres. And don't be afraid to use those parentheses. Final check. We're starting with an initial pressure and temperature. That temperature decreases. When the temperature decreases, since the pressure and temperature have a direct relationship, the pressure should decrease too. And looking at our P2, 8.33, that's definitely less than what we started with at 10.4. So this answer checks out. The three gas laws that we covered lead us to the combined gas law. You can combine all three of these laws to obtain this one law here. If you have pressure, volume, and temperature, then you can figure out one unknown variable. So you can change two and calculate the third. Let's apply that law. So we're starting with P1 V1 over T1 is equal to P2 V2 over T2. That's the combined gas law. Say we want to solve for V2. What I always like to do first is cross multiply. That makes life a lot easier. Now we have P1 times V1 times T2 is equal to P2 times V2 times T1. Then you can isolate V2. Divide by P2 times T1. The way that I write this, I combine the pressures and the temperatures. We pull out the volume on its own, P1 over P2. And then we've got T2 over T1. That's how you solve for V2. This is just one example. It's a very similar method for solving for any of the other variables. Make sure that you cross multiply first because that will make your life a lot easier. Now let's use it. You have a 10 liter sample 
of carbon dioxide gas at 300 Kelvin, one atmosphere. The volume and Kelvin temperature double. What is your new pressure? Let's write out what we have. 10 liters is a volume. And we're in that first sentence where it's saying you have a sample with these attributes. So all of these are going to have that one subscript because they're initial conditions. The volume and temperature are doubled. So if the volume was 10 liters, doubling it would make 20 liters. The Kelvin temperature is doubled. 300 Kelvin becomes 600. We have to calculate the new pressure. Since we have pressure, temperature, and volume, you've got to use the combined gas law. This is the combined gas law. This time, we're looking for P2. First, we're going to cross multiply. We're looking to solve for P2. Circling it helps me keep everything straight. If it doesn't help you, you don't have to do it. I'm just sharing the way that I do things because it seems to work. But there are definitely more, more ways to do this. As long as you stay organized, you should be fine. Divide by V2 times T1. And you get P2 on one side. Remember, I like to pull that pressure out so that when we do all of our math, the units cancel and we're just left with the units of pressure. And this is our equation. bookkeeping skills. Cannot stress that enough. Let's fill in some variables. I'm gonna do that in a different color here. It's too much uh too much of one color on here. So P one we've got one atmosphere V one over V two And then we have T2 over T1. So what this looks like is one atmosphere times one half times two. So your answer is one atmosphere. Those numbers were fairly easy. They will not always be that easy.
Now we're going to move on to talking about vapor pressure. And then we're going to talk about Dalton's law of partial pressures. So vapor pressure is a pressure that's exerted by gaseous vapor above a liquid when the rate of evaporation and condensation are equal. So if you have some water in a closed container, some of that water is going to become a vapor. At a given temperature, every liquid has a vapor pressure. Vapor pressure increases as the temperature increases. And vapor pressure is actually connected to the boiling point of a liquid. We're not going to talk about that, but just showing you chemistry comes full circle. When it comes to these partial pre these pressures, the vapor pressures, if we're talking about pressure in general of any gaseous vapor, we can combine gases together and have a total pressure exerted on a container. Dalton's law of partial pressure says that the total pressure of the mixture is going to be equal to the sum of each individual pressure from each gas. The pressure that's exerted by each gas in a mixture is called a partial pressure. So let's say, for example, you decide to go scuba diving. I don't know why you would, but some people do it. In that breathing tank, you need to have some oxygen, but not just pure oxygen. It's always a mixture. So it could be oxygen with nitrogen or oxygen, nitrogen, and helium. But let's say that you have this mix for scuba diving. Then the total pressure, which I usually write P sub T, is going to be the pressure exerted by the oxygen plus the pressure exerted by the nitrogen plus the pressure exerted by the helium. That's all Dalton's law says. Let's do a sample. A sample of noble gases contains helium, neon, argon, and krypton. We've got all these partial pressures and we have to figure out the total of the sample. Well, the total pressure is going to be the sum of all the partial pressures. So the partial pressure of helium plus the partial pressure of neon plus the partial pressure of argon and the partial pressure of krypton. We look at the information that's given in the problem. I like to highlight things you may underline or circle. It's completely up to, do, to you. You could also rewrite it. Fill in all the numbers. And then you add them together. Remember your rules for sig figs for adding. So that was way, way back. 
So if you need a refresher for that, go back to the prerequisite science, science skills, the very first lecture for this course. There's no tricks here. You just add everything up. The only thing that you want to watch for is to make sure that all of the units for the pressure are the same. So we'll do some practice where it's not, but you just have to do a, a conversion from one unit to another and then add it all up. Nothing hard here. So we can measure the volume of a gas by displacement. We talked about that in chapter two when we were talking about density. If you collect the gas in a graduated cylinder and that's over the top of water, what you're collecting is called wet gas because it also contains water vapor. Remember, every liquid has a vapor pressure at a given temperature. Whatever gas you're collecting from your reaction, if you're collecting it over water, that water also exerts a vapor pressure, which means there's some water vapor in that gas. This table, 10.2, tells you the vapor pressure of water in millimeters of mercury for every temperature from 5 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius in 5 degree increments. Remember that for gas laws we care about Kelvin, so you may need to convert your temperature from the problem into Kelvin if you need to use a gas law after that. So just mind, be mindful of your units. If we use Dalton's law of partial pressures, we can determine the pressure of our gas of interest and we can remove what we know about the water. So here we've got zinc metal reacting with sulfuric acid in solution. We're collecting hydrogen gas as a product over water. The total pressure that is exerted is going to be equal to the pressure from the hydrogen gas plus the pressure from the water vapor. If we need to figure out the pressure of the hydrogen gas then we can rearrange this equation. Subtract the partial pressure of water and what you get is the partial pressure of the hydrogen gas is equal to the total pressure minus the water vapor pressure. This is something that you can look up. Let me use a different color. I don't want you to get that confused with the hydrogen gas. You can look up the vapor pressure on the table that I showed you a couple of slides ago. It's in your textbook and you can also just refer to the notes here. When you're doing exam problems or homework problems, you'll be given that information. You don't need to memorize that chart. Here's a sample problem. A sample of hydrogen gas was collected over 20 degrees Celsius water. The atmospheric pressure, 755 millimeters of mercury. What is the pressure exerted by the hydrogen gas in the cylinder? We've got 20 degree water. 
we have a pressure and we fig need to figure out the pressure of the hydrogen gas. The atmospheric pressure, that tells us the total pressure. And from Dalton's law of partial pressures, we know that's equal to the water vapor pressure plus the pressure of the hydrogen gas. This value we can look up. You find 20 degrees Celsius on the table. And at 20 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure is 17.5 millimeters of mercury. We can rearrange the equation to solve for the hydrogen gas partial pressure. Just subtract the pressure of the water from both sides. Then you fill in your numbers. This is what your calculator is going to tell you. But in terms of sig figs, that is incorrect. Remember that you need to line up your numbers here. We only have up to the ones place with that atmospheric pressure. So that means when we report this, we can only have up to the ones place. This seven is our last retained digit and we're looking at the five to tell whether or not we increase by one or we stay the same. We've got five or greater, so we're going to increase by one. Seven hundred thirty eight millimeters of mercury is our final answer. So again, don't forget about those rules for adding and subtracting with sig figs prerequisite science skills if you need to brush up on that. So we've been talking a lot about the gas laws. We talked about the properties of gases. Let's now talk about the kinetic molecular theory, which also describes a gas. You'll need to know these so that you can answer kind of multiple choice type questions about them. Gases are made up of tiny molecules. That's kind of a no-brainer. They demonstrate rapid motion in straight lines. And they travel in random directions. So pretty much the movement of a toddler. Gas molecules have no attraction for one another. This also means that there's no repulsion either. When gas molecules collide in a container, they collide without losing energy. They just bounce off of each other as if nothing ever happened. The average kinetic energy of a gas molecule is proportional 
to the Kelvin temperature. So we have to use Kelvin whenever we do gas law problems. That's the kinetic molecular theory. It relates the properties of a gas to its kinetic energy. So we'll briefly talk about the concept of absolute zero since we're talking about Kelvin. When we talk about Celsius or Fahrenheit, we're talking about scales that are relative. Kelvin, however, is not relative. The temperature where the pressure and volume of a gas theoretically reaches zero is called the absolute zero. So let's say that you are plotting the temperature of a gas and the volume of a gas, right? Well, you can extrapolate that data all the way back to where it meets at zero for the temperature and the volume. Or excuse me, the pressure and the volume. And when you do that, you get absolute zero, which is minus 273 Kelvin. Absolute zero means no energy, no motion, no nothing. Everything is at a standstill. This is very different from when we say zero degrees Celsius or zero degrees Fahrenheit because you can say negative degrees Celsius and negative degrees Fahrenheit. There's no such thing with Kelvin. Once you reach zero, that's it. Now we're gonna get to the final gas law, the ideal gas law. Remember that pressure and volume are inversely proportional. But both of these, pressure and volume, are directly proportional to temperature and the number of molecules. If you introduce a proportionality constant, which we'll call a gas law constant, then you can write an equation P equals RNT over V. That's the ideal gas law. You can rearrange it and say PV is equal to NRT, which is what you'll usually see the ideal gas law written as. The constant R is the ideal gas constant. And for the purposes of our class, we will be using the value of 0 0.0821 liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin. And when you write that out, which I know this looks a little bit weird, but when we start doing some problems, you'll understand why the units are the way that they are. So let's try one. How many moles of neon gas occupy 2.34 liters at STP? We're trying to figure out how many moles. We have a volume, and we're told that we're at STP. STP means standard temperature and pressure. That's 0 degrees Celsius, which is the same as 273 Kelvin, and 1 atmosphere. The only gas law that deals with moles is the ideal gas law.
there's our gas law. We're solving for the number of moles, which is N. Divide both sides by RT, and you get that N is equal to PV over RT. Then we can substitute in our numbers. Make sure that your pressure is in atmospheres, your volume is in liters, and that your temperature is in Kelvin. The units are a little bit funky. So we've got liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. But since the R is on the bottom, it means that the moles times Kelvin is now at the top. If that doesn't really make sense to you, don't worry about it. Don't write in the units. Just know that 0.0821 is your gas constant and know the the unit that you need to have your answer in. N means moles. So whatever number you get, you write moles. Some folks like to see all the units cancel. And they do. To solve this problem in your calculator, I would recommend that you use parentheses. That way the multiplication happens and the division happens in the order that you want it to. When you do the math, you should get 0 0.104 moles. And that's your final answer. That's it. Thanks for watching. We're going to do some more problems in lecture, the live lecture, that bring in some of our um, chapter 8 and chapter 9 concepts to the gas laws. So make sure that you tune in for that. Practice problems and all the details regarding assignments and exams. This is the last lecture for Chem 103. So congratulations, you made it. There's just a little bit more. You can do it. I'm proud. Have a great one and be safe.